Hello, I'm Queens College President, Frank H. Wu. Today, we celebrate the 50th anniversary of Title IX, the historic federal legislation prohibiting educational institutions from discriminating against students on the basis of sex in intercollegiate athletics. It's one of those rare laws everyone knows the name of because of its cultural significance. Queens College is proud to say that thanks to the efforts of Lucille Cavalls, Gail Marquis, and Sharon Beverly, we were at the forefront of the Title IX movement. All of you took part in the first ever women's collegiate basketball game played at Madison Square Garden as the coach or player, and that brought women's basketball into the limelight. And each of you had a groundbreaking career in athletics and have continued the advancement of women's sports over the years. Queens College is so proud of all that you have done. It is thanks to your efforts that Queens College itself has long been an NCAA Division II school. We celebrate all of your achievements. Congratulations and thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Bet Namofsky, head women's basketball coach here at Queens College in New York City, and I am your host for this special program sponsored by the East Coast Conference and Queens College to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Title IX. And who better to talk about Title IX than these three remarkable women standing next to me? Uh, Queens College alum, Dr. Sharon Beverly, Queens College alum, Gail Marquis, and the legend herself, Lucille Cavallos. Dr. Sharon Beverly is a 1979 graduate of Queens College, playing in the first ever women's college basketball game at Madison Square Garden against Immaculata under the leadership of Coach Lucille Cavallos. Sharon went on to play professionally in Europe and then to a successful career in college athletics and higher education as a professor, coach, and administrator. She is currently Vice President for Recreation and Athletics at the University of Hartford. She is a member of the 2015 Queens College Hall of Fame class. Ms. Gail Marquis is a 1980 graduate of Queens College. A two-time All-American, she captained her team to postseason competition and national rankings for four straight years and also played for Coach Cavalls at the first MSG game. Following her college career, Gail went on to be a member of the 1976 U.S. Olympic team that won a silver medal and later played professionally overseas and in the U.S. Gail has been a broadcaster, worked in leadership positions in the financial industry, and higher education. She's a 2012 inductee into the Queens College Hall of Fame, is a member of the New York City Basketball Hall of Fame, and was also inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame as part of the 1976 U.S. Olympic team. Last but certainly not least, Coach Lucille Cavallos is regarded as one of the pioneers of women's college basketball. She became QC's head coach in 1968 and coached until 1981, finishing with an overall record of 239 wins to 77 losses. In 1973, she led Queens to the national championship game before falling to Immaculata 65-61. Her team's success opened the door to the Madison Square Garden appearance in 1975 receiving many accolades over the years for her contributions to both women's sports and women's basketball. She was inducted to the Queens College and New York City Basketball Hall of Fame. In 2017, the basketball court at Fitzgerald Gymnasium was renamed Lucille Cavallos Court, making her the first woman in New York City to receive such an honor. Ladies, thank you so much for joining me today. Pleasure. Our pleasure. You're welcome. So let's kick off with talking about what life was like pre-Title IX. Tell, maybe we'll start with you, uh, Sharon and Gail. Talk to me a little bit, paint the picture of what life was like for girls and women in sports before Title IX. Sharon, you wanna start? There were no sports for us prior to Title IX. If you played basketball, that was about all you were gonna get. There was no volleyball and tennis, and not at the high school level at least. So before Title IX, we had very few choices for the sports we wanted to play. What about you, Gail? And Coach Wallace will tell you the same thing. Uh, when I did play basketball at Andrew Jackson High School, we had six games. Oof. We had six games, and I thought that was a full season. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a full season. That's all we had. And we had some other sports, but, but like Sharon said, not much for girls. And, and again, those six games might have been on a court 
that was smaller than the regulation court because the boys needed the court because they had to practice. Not that they had a game, but they had to practice. So we were on a court that probably wasn't regulation. So at that time, the boys did play more games? Their, their, oh. their season was... Easily, more than six games? More than six games <laughs> easily. Plus, they had postseason activity, mm. like a playoff, like a, leading to a championship or something. Uh, so yours was just six games, that's it? No playoffs, right. no championship game? Punching cookies at the end. Okay. <laughs> and sometimes you didn't even have five on five. Okay. You had the old okay. girls six game, on six. which was six on six. Right. Because the women couldn't play full court five people running up and down the court right. now at, at that time when you when you're when you're living that and you're, you're, you're in that every day did you feel like it was unfair did you feel like you, so you did oh absolutely <coughs> yeah absolutely but I think the funniest thing is is playing in the playgrounds the way we got to play because we were girls was I would bring my ball ah. so you got the ball, <laughs> smart you gotta play smart <laughs> and when I was playing many years before these two I had to make a case to carry my own basketball to get to the playground because it was uh, a no-no for girls. So you had to hide the ball. I had to hide the ball. <laughs> exactly. So good segue. So as as a coach at that time, I mean, obviously you had a vision for what you wanted your women's basketball program to be. So tell us a little bit about the challenges of trying to accomplish your vision, put the things in place to, to accomplish your goals, your hopes, and your dreams prior to Title IX. Well, I have to go back a little bit <clears throat> to discuss or to let you know about my own experiences growing up as an athlete. Um, I picked up the, the game of basketball in junior high school when there was a recreational league, and, uh, and then there was a PAL uh, league for girls who played six-player games, and, and uh, Mirror Park Departments, we ended up... Uh, playing in Madison Square Garden for ch national championships, but this is all on a recreational level. Mm. Because the concept at the time was that girls and, and women uh, were athletically inept. You throw like a girl, you can't mm. be as uh, proficient. Um, so the, the uh, opportunities were limited, especially at the scholastic level in public schools in New York City. And so, in my own case, I had to join recreational teams, and I played with boys all the time. We played five-player up and down the court and, and whatever. So, when I got to coach, and my first uh, coaching job was at a high school in, in uh, uh, Catholic high school in New York City, we played six-player uh, rules, which was, I think, a great game myself. It was a, a passing game and a long shot shooting game and a lot of cuts. And then I started coaching at Westchester State College in Pennsylvania, and that state had uh, limited interscholastic uh, opportunities for girls. I came, I had players who came into me who were somewhat uh, uh, skilled in the fundamentals, and um, but they only could play ten, uh, maybe thirteen games uh, a year. So when I got to Queens College, we've had no interscholastic opportunities at the public high school mm -hmm. level. I had to, my first year in coaching, which was 68, 1968, I had to uh, recruit in some way. So I put signs up in the student union, if you like to run and jump and try out for the women's <laughs> basketball team. Yeah, this is on run. <laughs> I, I on run. And run. So, uh, and what happened to me was that I, uh, didn't have any opportunities to compete at a higher level. There were no Olympics, there were no national championships, there were no uh, state championships except in Iowa, uh, there were no, uh, no national championships and, and uh, I felt deprived in a lot of ways because I was uh, really uh, an outstanding performer. I usually at recreational le levels, we played tournaments in certain places, and I was always either the high scorer or the most valuable player. So I felt that this was a deprivation for me. And when I got to Queens, I was committed to developing a model of competency in athletics, for, for in basketball specifically. How did you, so it sounds like you took the job, you started with recruiting what you had on this campus and then 
at some point you probably realize it's not here. <laughs> I've got to go. I've got to go get Gail and Sharon. <laughs> so how did recruiting well, go after that when you're trying to recruit off campus? Well, let me let me just explain. <laughs> I first of all, I was hired here as an assistant professor of health and physical education, and I got the coaching because uh, job because I wanted to coach. And finally, after two years of being here, I got the assignment to coach. Gotcha. So I, my purpose was to develop a competent team and a skilled team insofar as I was able to do that. Right. And uh, now I planned a strategy of how I was going to do it, not just teaching the skills, but the strategy of actually playing the game <coughs> and what they were capable of. And there were a lot of tangible and intangible things I had to do. I had to teach them how to be responsible and to show up on time for uh, practices and games and so forth. Let, anyway. let me flip it really quickly, Coach, to, to actually to, to the two of you. What was the recruiting process for you guys at that time? I mean, I'm sure it looks very different than what recruiting is nowadays. I mean, you know as an athletic I, I director. Didn't, I didn't recruit them. Oh, you didn't? You were recruited. If anyone who wanted to play basketball at the highest level knew that you had to come to Queens College to do that. Because they were starting to put themselves on the map? Absolutely. And gotcha. the coach brought the national championship when she talked about the AIAW, they actually hosted a national championship here. Mm. And so I was in junior college at that point and got a chance okay. to come to Queens and see Gail hit the winning basket uh, for the national championship. And that was my sophomore year. And I said, this is where I want to go so she really didn't have to recruit gotcha. we came to Queens because we wanted to play for her we wanted to play for the best you have to understand that when I was uh, started coaching I realized that I had to do clinics so I got myself out there gotcha. and then um, a lot of these the coaches especially from Long Island uh, because there was um, would come would ask me to come to their schools to run clinics and that's what I did. I worked, it was like a second job. Mm. I was all over the place. And uh, and we went with them. And then then and I continued doing it and then these gals came with me. So, well, so well, the, the exact about, opposite than what it is now. I, I read about the um, team in the Long Island Press, the local okay. newspaper. Mm -hmm. There was one article on Sundays, Carolyn Kane who spoke about right. all of the all sports, whether it was high school basketball, college basketball, swimming, track, whatever, all in this little column on Sunday. That's right. And it always mentioned Queens College. So as a junior senior in high school, I had my eye on the school. And uh, uh, I even got my high school team because <coughs> Coach Cavallos was not coming to recruit us. She never came to see us. We came to see them. So well, I come to see you. I'm not sure I would have gotten But that's interesting. You picked me up. But we brought our high school team here to come and play them. And we thought we were playing the Vossi, but years later, we found out, years later, <laughs> we found out we, we had lost to the JV. <laughs> <laughs> but again, we had to come here so that they could see us. And then, like she said, she had notices on the walls out in the student union. If you want to run and jump, come try out. I already knew I was going to try out. And, and, you know, people will ask, well, what kind of funding? I said, my father paid for my college. But in the same token, it, it wasn't uh, at the exorbitant prices it is today. Right. It, it, you know, it was free. It was uh, uh, open enrollment. We could afford it because, you know, we had right. a big family. But still, uh, we ha I had to recruit her to come and, come and so see that, me. That's fascinating because it, it really has turned itself over, right? Because now as a student athlete, if I'm in, in, in high school, I'm trying to showcase myself. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like at that time, it was the opposite. You were trying to showcase yourself as a coach and your program. Yeah, so that's yeah, a yeah. real big shift. So that's, mm -hmm. here's what happened finally, a real important point. But after the 72 tournament, when we came out fifth, I was really ready to run the ball. And I got really, really turned on. And I put in for the tournament the 1973 AIW National Women's Basketball Tournament, knowing that it would uh, energize the whole uh, community, region. Yeah, the region. Yeah. But not only it went beyond that. Actually, what happened because we had we did a lot of publicity, and I had a great PR person who got the media here, and uh, the place was inundated with reporters and and cameras and and Dick Schaap who was a sports 
uh, announced it had its own program at the time. And it was, we had teams, 16 teams here from California, from Texas, from uh, Washington State, Washington, every place, Connecticut, every place. Up they and were down. all over the place. And they were all being interviewed and some of them brought their own uh, PR people. So it went, the publicity went berserk, it went national. And it was a major uh, media, the media, New York City is the media capital of the mm -hmm. world, and the media got really into when uh, they saw the opening, they saw what was going to happen, and um, from that point on, you know, I, I, I knew that we were, it was going to grow, and it did grow, and then in 70, 72 was when Title IX happened. So that, yes. that leads me to my next question. So, because uh, Queens College women's basketball, uh, at its as it was growing and, and, and getting on the map and becoming a national powerhouse and a contender, really intersects with about the same time as the passing of, of Title IX. Right. So, what was the climate at the time? You know, were, were you aware that this 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 bill was 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 uh, they're looking to pass this law, mm -hmm. and what was the climate? Were people excited about it? Were they skeptical about it? You know, as as students and as athletes, did you remember hearing about this 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 law, potential law called Title IX? You didn't know anything about it. No, no. nothing about it. You know, our advocates were actually the women that were out in front. So, you know, when they talked about equity, I remember getting to another school after this to coach, and someone said, well, you know, we, we'll have to talk about when the men, and when the women are going to practice. I came from a school where everything was equitable, mm -hmm. and she made sure of that. Mm -hmm. You know, we had the gym, the main gym that we're on right now, yeah. two times a week. The men had it two times a week. We alternated Fridays. So the, it was great to have that law when we look back on it, but it was really the women behind the scenes, Lucille Cavallis, Christine Grant. When she talks about bringing the national championship here for the AIAW, which was run by the women, because mm. the men didn't want us, the NCAA didn't want us, they got out in front and created this national championship for us. And that was the impetus for the first women's game that was at the Garden. Right. Because if it had not been for that and all the publicity and, and interest that was generated there, they sold this gym out for that game. Yeah. Cavallis was the one that said to them, and we can sell out Madison Square Garden. <laughs> and people thought it was crazy. And we almost did. Yeah, right. I and I want to say one more thing about Coach Cavallis and, and her saying about the excellence. I think, you know, to play for her, because she didn't have those opportunities, right, to play at that national level, she was relentless on us to really appreciate and take advantage of the of what we were giving in terms of an opportunity. So the women's games are coming out of the shadows, coming into the forefront. And yes, it was a Queens College and an Immaculata College, but then with the turn of Title IX, you started to get the University of fill in the blank. Mm. And that was almost, the end of the the smaller colleges well, that's exactly being at right. the top at the universities of when you were when you were an athlete at that time playing at Queens College under under coach were you were you aware of um, how hard she was fighting for you guys at that moment were you aware of it or did you realize it more afterwards as you well I know for me we were only aware of of the results of her efforts mm. we weren't aware of the constant pressure that she would get to have to fight for us. So mm -hmm. we could sometimes see her and I don't remember what the men's coach name Charlie was, Crawford. But they would Charlie be in Crawford. the corner arguing about something and we would be shooting knowing that it had something to do with what we were getting mm -hmm. or what they didn't want us to get or some publicity. But I, I wanted to also jump back to the AIW mm -hmm. and the importance of that. So this group of women now were sponsoring this national championship for us and eventually they moved into as gail was saying the palestra and, and different arenas funded by women mm. so these former basketball players i think of kathy andrewsy who was a entrepreneur she was one of the she was mm. what domino's domino's pizza, or pizza. the spot the women were the ones that were actually giving back and helping us move this forward. Mm -hmm. Yes, the law was there, but it had nothing to do with the law. It had to do with women taking initiative. So Coach Cavallis, um, you know, as we said, Grant, 
Andrewsy and sponsors getting behind women to sponsor our national championship in big arenas, now that really made the NCAA mm -hmm. uncomfortable. Right. And that's, yeah, eventually was the demise for for the AIEW, which was, which was really sad because it was women promoting women and what we can do and accomplish. So that actually leads me to my next question. Uh, so here we are 50 years later, right? And obviously a lot of positives have transpired in that time, but there's a lot of, of work left to done, left to be done. So, you know, looking back on the last 50 years, what what do you think are the the biggest changes since Title Title IX, and what changes do you think Gail still need to happen? Well, you know, one thing I didn't want to um, uh, lose track of yep. was that coaches like um, Lucille Cavallis and my Olympic coach also Billy Billy Jean Moore. Yeah. Uh, some of the things they would do would would not would be not telling us. Mm -hmm. They didn't mm. tell us when they had these battles. Mm -hmm. uh, I was on the Olympic team, so you figure that is the elite of the elite. I didn't know until 10 years after, after the, the games that we didn't have any money. The U.S. Olympic Committee didn't think that the women's team would be there, so there was no budget, so they didn't have any. So the administrator for the men's team, uh, Bill Wall, he gave Billie Jean Moore the credit card. Once we had qualified, he said, get them whatever they need. Mm. And, and to the point about you know how much further we have to go, you know Title IX was wonderful in terms of increasing opportunities for girls and women, absolutely wonderful. It's increased, you know, we, we have the data on that. Where it fell short was what it did to the leadership for the mm. women's for women um, and women of color. So when we look at Division One, the number of women leading programs is less than fifteen percent. Um, number of women that are of color. You know, I, I know we've got the, uh, Williams at Virginia, but other than that, I don't know who else is there. Well, we have Phil and Stanley. As a coach. Uh, yes, as, oh, a, as coach. a coach. Absolutely. Well, but yes. not as an administrator. But not as an yeah. administrator. Right. Yes. Right. Because the jobs became attractive and they started giving them to men. Because jobs became attractive. And, and, and pay. And typically, pay also. we find when you do data, people hire people that they feel comfortable right. with, right? right? And they hire people that look like them. Look like them, so sound like them. So in charge of programs, oftentimes they were hiring other men. Right. They pick up the phone and ask, who do you know that coaches? And so, you know, folks get left out of that mm -hmm. coaching rank. But then also in terms of the administrative piece, we don't, we don't have women leaders and models for our young girls growing up. And, and that's the other thing that we have to make sure we talk about. The, the, the whole conception of being a girl versus mm -hmm. a man. And Coach Cavallis instilled that in us. You know, it was not the boy, the men's team and the girls right. team. Right. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm with you and on I that one. I'm with you on that one. I took that through my entire coaching career. Yeah. Same question to you. W w did the leadership that she demonstrated every day um, lead you to want to go into athletics, to go into coaching? Or did you already have that drive and then you came to Queens College and it just kept that drive going? Definitely did not have the drive to want to be a coach. Hmm. Um, but I think the experience here gave all of us that have come through it under coaches' tutelage a confidence about us. Um, and that drive for excellence just seemed to transcend everything in my life. Mm -hmm. So whatever I wanted to do, I wanted to do it and be the best at it. And we saw that in her every day. So we could be up, literally, we could be up at halftime by 20. Mm -hmm. And we would be afraid to go in that classroom over there to the <laughs> side because somebody missed a layup. And we knew we were going to hear for the whole 10, 15 minutes, whatever it was, about how that we missed this layup. And I can remember I'd look over at Gail and Gail would look at me and then we'd look over at somebody else and we knew what was going to happen. Right. And we were going to get it because we were not perfect and we were constantly looking to accomplish that excellence mm -hmm. so yeah it, it the coaching piece I mean uh, when we came back I came back from Europe earlier than Gail did and got the opportunity to work with coach and see her see the behind the scenes and see how she actually put together the pieces on the court of what we did um, having that I used to say it was like taking basketball 401 you know not even 301 like 401 right and started to fall in love with it then. And yes, that same drive, that attention to detail mm -hmm. that she had, 
Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. it was so critical to our success, that attention to detail. And you saw her today as she breaks down these little small <laughs> details that are so important. It, it's what makes you, it, it's the difference between winning and losing, you know. And it's and overall, so it's a great reminder that representation matters. Mm -hmm. You know, Absolutely. having a female uh, head coach who, who demonstrated, uh, set the bar for leadership. And having that opportunity as a young woman to compete. Right. Because we need that. You know, mm -hmm. you talk about going on Wall Street, you need that drive and that experience of competing and having the really... Setting goals. Yes, yeah, set setting a goal goals. And, and go after it. And and you know what? Sometimes failing and figuring that out just and having important. the initiative to continue That's on. That's right. important. That all came from from playing at Queens. Mm -hmm. That leadership. And playing for Lucille Cabal. I don't think I was strong, confident, uh, you know, for those first couple of years. I didn't say that much. I really had to get pissed off to say something. Well, well ask Coach well, if she, she felt the same way. Sure. <laughs> pushed around a little bit. Pushed her around a little bit. She went to her mother and cried about it. I did. And my mother said, that's your fault. You wanted to go there. Ms. Cabalas is right. That's what my mother said. Oh, my too. gosh. <laughs> but I would go back. I always went back. And then after the four years, when you, you get out there and you see it's not the same, you know, I have yeah. to raise my, not raise my voice in yelling, but you have to speak up. You have to step into it. So it all, it all comes from that. It spills over. No, I didn't go into coaching, but I went into business, which is right. wonderful because that's, that's locker, another layer of people right. to see. Locker you know. room to boardroom. That's, that's right. And you have that confidence because you figure if you can lift through what oh. she <laughs> was through, everything else was a piece of cake. I'm not scared of anything. I'm not yeah. scared of anything. But I, I want to go back to uh, the beginnings of the rumblings of the women starting to hunch out and right. wanting more opportunities. What happened at Queens College was the media. The fact that we got out there and we showed, we had, we developed the model here at Queens College. Then we advertised it all over the country, along with other things that were happening, like the Billie Jean King thing. And we started to change the culture in the society for women com competing in sport. You know, I don't hear it anymore. Oh, you throw like a girl. Yeah. I don't hear that anymore. So that's what the significance of this program mm -hmm. is. So I have one last question because we could go on forever and I've no. really enjoyed this very much. Is one, is there a question that I haven't asked and a point that needs to be made that I haven't given you the opportunity to make? And two, what would you like to see next in, in regards to Title IX and equity in women in sports? I think one thing Sharon was, was uh, harping on it a little bit, but I want to see more more women uh, teaching women, more women coaching women. Um, I feel that men got into the college game and even into the pro game because we finally got paid. You know, they weren't trying to run after a salary of $500 a month. They can't feed their family on that. But once the salaries came up, yes, more men came in to coach the women's game, whether it's basketball, swimming, or whatever. I want women to have those roles because I saw Becky Hammond go to the... Uh, hey, she's... She went to the men's program, the San Spurs. Antonio yep. Spurs, and that was the right coach for her to be with because he was amiable and he taught her and she learned. But she was, she's never going to be an a NBA coach. You know, she'll have to be, she wouldn't have to be 80 years old and then they'll say she's too old. I am so glad that Becky Hammond came back to coach in the women's women. league, yeah. lead them to a championship, let it be seen what right. women can do. Right. Yeah. To, to support what Gail just said. Um, if you see it, you believe it. And if you never see it, um, we have some women in, in some sports um, that come up and they've never had a woman coach yeah. their whole entire yeah. life. And that, that's not good. Um, part of the research I've done is, is why we don't have more of our women going for coaching positions. Mm. I can tell you on the administrative side, when we advertise for a job, I'm not getting a lot of women yeah. applying. Yeah. And I don't know if it's because they don't have the confidence, because they think they won't get the opportunity, but they're not putting themselves out there. So I think what I would like to see is more of a, an, an effort from the NCAA to really get to our younger women and get in their minds about okay. these leadership positions. Because guys do it. Men, if they see someone that has potential, they pull them aside and say, mm -hmm. hey, did you ever think about, right. you know, you'd be a great manager, and that yeah. manager then leads to, did you ever think about being mm -hmm. in the in the uh, sports information office, athletic communications, you'd be great. Oh, hey, did you ever think? We don't do that as women. 
So I think we as women need to start to identify those skills that we see and bring them in. in our, absolutely. In that, our young people. That's a great and point. talk to them about these opportunities that they that's have. That's a great point. I'm going to tell you a quick story. The person who got me involved in coaching was our men's basketball coach at the school that I went to. And, and he saw something in me, and I wish that I... I actually asked him what he saw, but he <laughs> actually was the one who pulled me aside and said, have you ever thought about coaching? I think he'd be a great coach, because I never thought about coaching. I thought I was going to be a physical education teacher. Mm -hmm. So that's actually a really, really valid point. I've lived that. So mm -hmm. thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, we need to do more of that yeah. as women. And that's not to say that men can't be great, right. great mentors, right. um, but yeah, we as women yeah. we take more of an initiative and do that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to wrap it up there, but I really do want to thank all three of you for this. I've really enjoyed it very much, so thank you for your time today, sharing your thoughts, your experiences, your knowledge. Uh, we're really, really grateful for it. So Gail, Sharon, Coach K, thank you so much for today. You're I really so appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.